Hey everyone, it's Maggie back here with Vlogist Day 9, and um, today we're going to do an Ask Maggie segment. So uh, a few days ago I asked for questions on uh, Twitter and Facebook, and I have kind of a mixed group of those. I kind of picked one question from each person that answered, and I uh, will do my best to answer them as we go. So I will be reading these off the screen. So the first one, um, Nicholas Jr. So he asked, uh, he was moving to Kirkland and Seattle in 73 days. So he would like to know where he can find opening board game groups. And um, to Nicholas's point, there sometimes it's a little confusing when you move to a city how to actually meet people to game with. And what I'll say from my personal experience, I met most of my gaming friends through Meetup. So meetup.com has a lot of location-specific board game groups that you can join. Um, speaking of Kirkland specifically, I don't have anything, but I do know that um, I did very well using Meetup to meet people. And in the next month or so, I should be starting a new public game night, um, kind of co-sponsor between my work and another place. Uh, once I have more details on that, it'll be at Muck's Boarding House once a month, and it should be really exciting. So. Um, when you do hit Seattle or Kirkland, if you'd like to try and get a game in, by all means hit me up. We'll find a space in my schedule. I'd be happy to come meet you. And um, that goes for most people. <laughs> uh, I won't say anytime, anywhere, but I will certainly try and make an effort when people want to play a game. Uh, next was Patrick, the lovely Patrick. He said, if an evil genie held me prisoner and would only let you go if you spent a week and said a life-size version of a board game, which board game would you choose? And I would say Arboretum because it's just pretty and I can spend a week within a uh, giant forest any day. Uh, Randy said, what is your go-to game when you can't decide what to play? And now I will preface this by saying, this will definitely be a top 10 vlog of things that are go-to games when you can't decide what to play. But for our group in general, we can't decide what to play when we're at these weird numbers. So I'll say Rococo is one of the ones we'll pull out when we're like five players and not sure what to play. Rococo is an excellent game for that. Uh, next was Robin, who asked, do I have a favorite spot inside the store? And if so, where and why? Uh, in my... My store, the original store, my favorite spot is probably the converted puzzle room. So originally we had this giant room full of puzzles and eventually made it into uh, an add-on to our cafe. And it's beautiful with this cool tin roof and everything. Um, maybe sometime I will take you guys through a little tour of the two stores with uh, the Vlogus thing. It might be kind of fun. Um, next, Suze asked, what game would you use to bring a Magic player into the hobby board game world? And if they were a competitive Magic player, um, I would say Netrunner is an excellent choice because it is as deep and as competitive as Magic can be. And for a casual gamer, I like Foretold, which was this really goofy kind of, it felt a little bit like EDH where you're all kind of deck building, but it's got a weird, like, mixed person combat system and it was really cool especially for our first uh, effort. Suze then asks what are the biggest misconceptions people have about board game stores or cafes? Um, the biggest misconception I've found is that people think that there is a golden formula to opening them uh, that if you follow certain steps you're just going to be successful no matter what you do and also that they are controlled by giant corporations instead of just very small passionate parties. Um, and then she asks, Who's, what's my favorite convention and why? Um, but easily, hands down, my favorite convention I've been to is BGGCon. Um, it is my personal vacation every year, so I, I go to BGGCon because it is focused on the gaming aspect of the game. Uh, it doesn't have the buying, it doesn't have the frenzy. You, you have some people that wake up and kind of storm the vendor hall when it opens, but not to the extent of Gen Con or Essen or any of that. Then she asked why am I so awesome, and I said, because I have friends like Suze. And then we have Willie. Uh, he asked, what has been some of your played once and done games recently, and why? And he and I talked a little bit more about this, and this includes the learning game plus one. Um, my latest one that I definitely did not care for was Parfum. 
And I get frustrated with any game that doesn't seem to add anything to the hobby that feels boring and old before you've even finished your first playthrough. Um, before that, Queen's Architect kind of fell flat for us because it had such a genius mechanic and um, did not rely on it, which is unfortunate. Um, any small Kickstarter games, I won't name them by name because it's just, you can tell from a mile away when a game doesn't have anything to add to the hobby. And the second that a game maker says, well, I've never seen blah that does blah, blah, blah before, you know that they just haven't played enough games because everything's been done. And now where we are in the hobby is all about finding a new cool way of introducing it or a new cool way of making a mechanic sing that hasn't been seen before. But certainly everything has been done. Uh, Z asked, what qualities do you prefer in gaming opponents, and what qualities do you find off-putting in game opponents? Um, for me personally, yelling in any instance is a complete... I, I can't deal with it. Yelling in general either makes me very angry or makes me cry. So when people yell at me during a game, I get very upset, and I don't really care for that. Um, other than that, I would say... People that pick apart your actions in a negative manner, if I make, especially aggressive actions, if I do something that hurts you in a game and you ask me 20 questions about it, I'm certainly not going to do that again. That's, I mean, that's preventative if you don't want me to mess with you, but I'm very likely not to play that type of game with you again because I've definitely played with people who think that the aggressive, interactive move is always the least strategic and I disagree with that. There's a difference between myself gaining 10 points and myself costing someone 10 points and sometimes the latter is better. Um, Charles asked, given your choice of any board game and players living or not, what game would you play and with whom? Uh, so this is a really hard one because I would, I love my gaming crew. I we have been together for a couple years now, and so I would probably put together my regular Tuesday night crew, Mal, you're included, um, and I would play Dominant Species. I'd, I'd play a six-hour amazing game that you can later wax on about as if it was a climbing a mountain together. It, it's the type of game that creates stories that you tell within your crew. Um, for someone I've never played a game with before, uh, I'd still love to play with Rhiannon and Ox, uh, who I've never actually played with over a table and I've very rarely interacted with in person. Um, Benny says, what are the best games for cons versus playing at home or in public? So conventions have a different vibe about them. And depending on the convention, this will vary, but I, I'm assuming he's talking like local cons or small casual cons. Um, there's something to be said about those goofy little games that just have something funny to them. Uh, the most recent con game I think I purchased was Felix the Cat in the Sack, where it's a cool game with a kind of neat me mechanism, but you're not going to play it all the time. The other kind of con game I find to be appealing are the longer games that you just haven't found a reason to get on a table. Very recently, I was going to spend the weekend at a con, and I was planning on getting Zia, um, the Drift System game, on a table, and I felt like that's super a con game, because I very rarely am I going to find time and space to play Zia, and I don't think it's strategically deep enough for me to like warrant the no amount of time it might take. Uh, Brian asks, what is the weirdest game you've played in the last year? Oh boy, weirdest game. Um, <laughs> you know, the weirdest game I might have played was uh, the Arena of the Planeswalkers, the magic board game, because they took HeroScape, which I've played before, they added instants and sorceries, and then they, f I feel like they took it down a notch for the base game, so you pay 35 bucks, and so you can buy this base game, but there's like, there's very little to it, and there's very little terrain, and there's very little obstacles, and it just feels like a hamstring version of HeroScape, which is okay, because I know in the future they're going to release more stuff, but it was it was weird as a first go. Um, Chris asks, if you could erase one myth about game stores and comic shops, what perception would you erase? And unfortunately, I think what he wants me to say is that I would erase the kind of comic book store guy from The Simpsons, but... Unfortunately, in my experience, that is more prevalent than not. I, I walk into a game store or a comic book shop and I either get 
asked if I'm buying something for a boyfriend. I get asked if I've read a comic before. I get kind of shown to the lighter sections of the game or the gift sections of a game store. And that's not true in Seattle as much. Seattle is super... We're, we've got so many game stores and so many comic book stores that it's kind of risen to the point where they actually understand that they need to just ask their customer what they're looking for. But anywhere else I go, I get kind of awful service. And it will, it will change eventually. The board game cafe or the restaurant hybrid model will overtake this theory that, you know, girls don't play games. Um, but I, I don't think there is a myth about game stores. I think there are a few game stores that fight against the norm and they clean and they understand service and they want to provide value beyond asking why people are buying games on Amazon. You're going to buy a game on Amazon because it's cheap, but you might buy one from a store if the store is good to you. Uh, Chris also asks, who are your favorite board game artists? Now, I unfortunately have a horrible, horrible, horrible habit of not paying attention to the artists of my games. Um, the artist from uh, Pret-a-Porte is an amazing artist, and he's done a bunch of things through Fantasy Flight, and I can't name his name off the top of my head. So I, I think it's interesting that in France, artists actually get equal billing with game designers because they're creating the experience for you. But here in the States, they don't do that as much. Um, so maybe I should be paying more attention to the artists in my board games. Maybe that's a thing. Uh, Christy asks, you prefer Euro-style board games, but what theme can you not resist? She says she'll pick up anything about dungeon crawling or that's Lord of the Rings skinned. I honestly, to an extent, I look for themes that seem silly or off the wall. Um, and recently, I figured out that anything that puts me in an occupation I admire, I would probably pick up. So um, there are two games coming out that are about TV programming. And I always thought that would be a really interesting job. So there's one called The Networks from my friend Gil, which is a lighter heart one. And there's one called Primetime. And I think me being a TV scheduler would be a really interesting job. So of course that attracts me. Um, I think the theme of Tomorrow attracted me, where it was a war theme, but you were being rewarded for being ruthless. But um, there's nothing that I can think of off the top of my head that will just automatically get me into a game. Christopher Curry asks, what games did you hate at first but end up liking later? Um, the, the easiest answer for this one was Ginkopolis. Uh, Ginkopolis was a holy mess worth of stuff that I didn't understand. And the rulebook was hard, and I played it, and I couldn't tell if I liked it. And it took me at least four or five plays to really, really start liking the game. Um, I, and I worry I didn't give Brussels enough of a chance because it had a similar problem to me. It was just like this big, goofy mess of mechanics that I didn't really like. But um, that one was certainly one it took me a long time to figure out. Gil asks, what is the worst board game-related injury you've received? Now, this doesn't seem that bad, but uh, right after I got my last tattoo, um, there's this, like, tattoo on my wrist, I was unpacking a bunch of boxes downstairs in our receiving bay, uh, just helping out, and I got a paper cut across my brand new tattoo, and that was probably the most board game related injury I've received. It hurt like hell, and it definitely messed up my tattoo a little bit, so. Erwin uh, asks... As someone who makes a lot of board game purchases and who purchases for a game store that sells to customers with a wide variety of customers, how do you evaluate games for one or the other? How do you evaluate a game purchased differently for the two? And fun stories where you had to struggle to make a decision because of the conflict there. Now, I actually, it's like Erwin lobbed me a softball, but I, I do. I purchase for a board game store that sells everything. It sells munchkin and gloom and flux or things are not my personal taste. They sell Euros, they sell smash em up crazy fighting games, they sell minis. And so um, when I look at a game for work, I have to look at did they support the rules? Did they write them clearly? Who is this for? Who does it sell for? Do the bits in the box, you know, make up for the price? 
does it have some sort of flashy cover or does it have an interesting theme? And evaluating a game for the game store, honestly, I'm pretty lucky because we have such a wide array there that I get to order a lot of things. And it's really the more stuff I don't carry that's more interesting to me. Um, it's when a game is just a big old hot mess or I feel like it didn't do its job in marketing or whatever. Um, but I do feel kind of funny you know, selling games that I think are bad games. And so I, I tend to try and figure out, okay, who is this game for? Did it do a good job of marketing to that person? And that's an evaluation process that is completely different than would I buy a game. Because would I buy a game is way more narrow focused. And I can't do that for everyone. So it just, it took time and it took a lot of me helping people pick out games and play games with other people and you know you just have to be empathetic and I think compassionate and that's something I'm good at so it ended up being okay for me. Jeff asks if you could be a tabletop game which one would you be and why? Um, a tabletop game? Um, that requires knowing the theme of games Jeff. Come now. Uh, I would certainly like to be a netrunner. That kind of cyberpunk world is pretty cool. Uh, Lindsay asks, what a good board game for an explorer type player to play with a super strategist? Like the people who, people who try to power game Dixit or Deceit. Um, I think she's trying to ask if there are good games that mix casual and experienced gamers. And honestly, I think you have to have a modicum amount of luck mixed with an interesting, clever mechanic. So, um, Cockroach Poker is the one I'll mention where no matter how good you are at strategy games, it's still a bluffing game, it's still people versus people, and it tends to put you on a more even plane with someone who's not as good as games as you. Um, for actual real life board games, um, something like Race for the Galaxy, though you will get your butt, butt kicked if someone's played it more than you at first. Um, it does a good job of ramping you in very quickly, getting you to a point where you can at least compete with people. It's kind of like chess that way. And that only the people that have 300 extra games in you would actually be able to kick your butt. And then Michael Mendez adds on his lovely question. And I'll just leave that as a visual representation. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> So I think that's all the questions I had. I hope I answered them adequately. Perhaps I may have wanted to script this out, but I thought it would be kind of fun to see what I could do. Uh, I will be back tomorrow with another game uh, review, and I will see you all later. Bye.